Hello, good morning, and welcome to Nature Live Online from the Natural History Museum. I'm Khalil Thurloway. While our doors may be shut for the time being, we still want to provide you with a little inside peek at the science and the people that make the museum what it is. I know there are lots of important conversations and actions going on at the moment about crucial social issues, but that doesn't mean we should stop caring about our planet as well as the people around us. We'd love to hear from you guys at home as well, so if you've got any questions today, please do pop them in the comments section and we'll try to come to as many of them as we can in the time we've got. Today, we're gonna to be finding out about some of my favorite animals and certainly some of the strangest, jellyfish. Now, as the proud owner of a rather large jellyfish tattoo, I'm really looking forward to this one. So to help introduce us to these weird and beautiful creatures, we've got Miranda Lowe, who studies these beauties at the museum. Hi, Miranda, thanks for joining us. Hi, hi everyone, yeah, hi Khalil. So before we get into the, uh, the nuts and bolts of what makes jellyfish so cool, why don't you start off with giving us a bit of a picture of what you do at the museum? Um, well, I'm one of the um, many curators that work behind the scenes at the museum. So I work in Darwin Centre in, in the Phase 1 building, so the very first one of all the Darwin Centres. And um, so what I do there as a curator, I look after many different specimens, but there are two major groups of collections that I look after. So one um, is the crustacea collection. So that involves crab, shrimps and lobsters and many different shapes and forms. And then the Nidaria collection, which includes corals, sea anemones, hydroids and jellyfish, which we're going to talk about today. And part of my role of looking after those collections, what it involves is giving people access, other scientists, myself working on those collections, artists and um, providing tools, but also to make sure that these um, specimens and animals, they're often pickled in, in jars. So some of my collections are um, in 80% alcohol, the common term for it, to preserve them for hundreds of years to study. And um, then I have some dry collections so dry corals dry crabs shrimps and lobsters and then the jellyfish that we're going to talk about today are um, uh, pickled and jarred in a weak solution of formaldehyde um, so that's a very special solution to actually keep their, their shape and, and body form and I guess because they are such soft and jelly organisms you've got to be really careful how you prepare them and how you, how you preserve them yeah, that's right. So that's why we use um, um, a weak solution of formaldehyde um, because it preserves their tissues better. So just by the word that we call them jellyfish or jelly, some of us like to call um, as an umbrella term, um, they're very gelatinous and soft. And um, so we want to make sure we preserve the tissues um, much better in that preservation fluid. And um, formaldehyde is quite toxic. So um, if we're going to study the jellyfish, take them out of the jars and, and, and want to study them under the microscope, um, we'd actually take the jar into um, a special lab where there's a ventilated workspace that will take away all the toxic fumes of the formaldehyde. And also we'd take um, the jellyfish out and we'd pop it into a Petri dish or a dish where you're going to examine it um, that is filled with distilled water. So we use water um, to <laughs> stop the jellyfish specimen from drying out. Um, but it enables us to work on it, basically. I think it's kind of funny that you take a venomous organism like a jellyfish and then you put it in a toxic uh, preservative like formaldehyde, yeah. putting poison in poison. Um, yeah, it's really this is our collection. Because the museum itself has you know, something like 80 million specimens. Um, but how many of those are, are our jellies? So we've got half a floor in the Darwin Centre full of cupboards, um, probably over 200 or more cupboards and uh, 12 shelves in each, as you can see there on screen, um, full of different um, types of jellyfish, different shapes and forms. Uh, we've got, you know, things from cherry jellyfish um, that are moon jellyfish, right to box jellies and cone jellies and south. So every jellyfish or jelly jelly-like form animal that you can think of. And from um, a varying years as well, we've got things from the 1800s right up to, you know, the, the, the present day. It's amazing that we've got such a, a record there of, of, of all these different specimens that were collected over such, such a long period of time, which give us such a, a great window back into the, in, into yeah. the, the ecology of, of the oceans. Um, going into the jellyfish themselves, 
why, why are they so great? Why, why, why do you like them? Why do you study them? Uh, and what, what's so amazing about them? Um, well, as you can see there from that picture alone, they're just absolutely stunning. Um, and they draw you in beautiful, beautiful colours, shapes, quite graceful movements at times, interesting colours and patterns. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and, and you can get such stunning photography um, from them as well. And I can see behind you as well, Khalil, that you've got <laughs> some amazing pictures. Um, they're just, whenever I visit an aquarium, I'm just amazed. And I can stand or sit and watch them for, for ages, how each tentacle, how, they, how their body moves, essentially, and everything else. Um, just, I and, absolutely and agree. Really calming. <laughs> And there's such a variety of them as well. Yeah, um, from one of our viewers, Jacob is, is asking you, what's your favorite jellyfish in particular? And 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 what, yeah, what make what you think about it? Um, well, a lot of things that I work on in general are very tiny and quite small. So I my favorite jellyfish is the um, lion's mane jellyfish. So it's quite big that's um, one of the biggest right yeah it's quite big and and dramatic um basically because you can see all the elements the makeup of the jellyfish a lot more a lot easier um so i quite like that and the stunning kind of radiant colors that um it gives it emits it gives off so yeah that's my favorite yeah i'd be hard pressed <laughs> to pick a favorite um <laughs> but in, in, in answer to lily's question on youtube my tattoo is of is based on a sea nettle which is oh, quite yeah. Quite a standard looking jellyfish with a girl. Mm -hmm. No, um, so yeah, Lily, who asked on YouTube, that's the answer. Uh, brilliant. <laughs> um, so, what, why don't we go into the biology of jellyfish? Because they're not fish, are they? But they are jelly, right? They are jelly, gelatinous, jelly like. Um, no, the fish part in their name, no, they're not fish. Um, because uh, fishes have fins, tails, and, and true backbones. eyes and backbones, yes. So um, jellyfish are invertebrates, so uh, invertebrates are animals without backbones. And um, so the jellyfish actually essentially are using um, their water body, the, um, the, the ocean that they're in to support um, th their body and their movement. Um, yeah, so. And, and you mentioned earlier that they were part of um, a group called the Cnidarians, which includes other things like corals and anemones. Um, can you expand on that a little bit, please? Yeah, so um, virtually, um, essentially jellyfish are cousins of um, corals and sea anemones. And the reason why um, they're related is because um, all of those animals have some um, intensity or form of sting and they have tentacles. Um, uh, you can see there some beautiful tentacles there, which, um, for, you know, have stinging cells. Oh, and what you can see there, so um, most of us might be familiar with the common form of a jellyfish, which is a round kind of like moon shape, so a moon jellyfish. But what you just saw there was um, a, not actually a jellyfish at all, um, even though it's... That was, that was a, a, a different type of uh, a siphonophore, but that, that example is the really commonly known Portuguese man of war. Yes, so that's a Portuguese man of war. And um, the reason why it might be different from what I would call a true jellyfish or a moon jellyfish, the bell of a moon jellyfish is quite circular in shape. Um, and um, with that, it has a, um, a radial symmetry. So, um, you know, from the top to the bottom. And with um, a moon jellyfish, it doesn't essentially have a left and a right like we have a left and a right hand. You can't distinguish it in that way. So it's a, a circular um, and kind of body form. And for a siphonophore, you can see that it's quite elongated. Um, it has a bit of a sail. And um, you would generally see, so that, that top part of its body actually filled with gas. And you would see that sailing or bobbing along the top of the ocean. But don't let that deceive you how beautiful that's looking because underneath it will have these long trailing tentacles stinging, stinging uh, which have stinging cells. And siphonophores are known as um, one of the longest um, animals in the ocean. 
Whereas a moon jellyfish that have that rounded um, shape of the bell, you'd find that pulsating and swimming in the, within the ocean. And um, around that bell of that jellyfish, you've got um, the tentacles with the thing itself. But in the center, essentially, you will see, that's why I like the lion's mane jellyfish, because you'll see like um, the central arms, these kind of quite frilly, um, quite wide central arms that they use to move. And uh, so did we, you know, we, we've kind of defined jellyfish as being you know, related to corals and, and anemones and do, having a similar role uh, in, in some ecosystems as the kind of siphonophores, but they're different from those. Hmm. What really defines a jellyfish itself? Like what, what, what makes a jellyfish a jellyfish? Um, well, for um, the jellyfish, um, the moon jellyfish, if you look at it from the top, you can see um, what is really visible because for us as human beings, it's human beings, it's not visible um, on the surface, but you can see from looking at a moon jellyfish on the top, they're like full horseshoe shaped rings. Um, and they are the gonad gonads, like the sexual organs that you can see um, that help them reproduce. And jellyfish um, actually contain um, um, the eggs and sperm that they will release into the oceans when um, they are going to reproduce um, and the they have those moon jellyfish they have like a central mouth and um, for siphonophores actually um, they can often have um, a, a mouth separate from the stomach um, which is not generally the case for um, kind of like the more regular jellyfish they have that it's a kind of one simple hole basically to feed and, and everything else. Well, I oh, and I must say, they don't have a brain either. <laughs> okay, so we, we've had a few uh, viewers actually asking about that. So how, if they don't have a, a brain in the way that we would think of it, how do they coordinate their, their movements and, and how do they respond to the thing in their environment? Well, it's going to be um, a lot more kind of like sensory and chemical within within a water body environment. Um, and, and so, you know, their, their movement is responsive um, in terms of the ocean tides or waves, other jellyfish around them. They, they have, um, you know, chemosensory organs as well. Um, uh, you know, stinging cells that if a, another a small fish should brush past them or another organi organism, they may get sting from it or they may be predated on by that particular jellyfish because some of them um, um, eat um, small um, young fish as well that can get wrapped up in the tentacles and kind of paralyzed and then um, digested within the mouth of the jellyfish. Um, and uh, yeah, so there are multiple ways. And and so we, this again links us into another question that uh, we've had from the audience. What sort of things do they eat? Which is a question from from the you know, Grabble Junior. And Anna and Zeb have, have added to that question. What do they eat? And do they poo? Ah, now I don't know if anybody has studied Je um, Jenny. <laughs> that would be an interesting one. But they, well, they must be emitting not the poo that we think it is. And because they live, you know, in a, and, and they're gelatinous water bodies, they must be um, producing some kind of some they can't digest. Yeah, because they can't digest everything. So there must be some other substances that are being expelled, you know, naturally in the water body. Um, yes, yeah, so jellyfish um, tend to predate on um, very small, small little organisms. Although, um, before I ask that again, I, you probably um, remember this, Khalil, and the audience, but in one of the um, uh, uh, Attenborough shows where they showed this um, jellyfish, the tentacles coming down on another animal and actually wrapping around its tentacles around the animal to kind of pull it and prise it apart. That was an interesting um, battle there. So um, jellyfish tend to eat um, or prey on young fish, um, plankton in the ocean, so tiny other organisms, um, zooplankton, phytoplankton, really microscopical organisms in the ocean, such as um, copepods, because they're another animal that I kind of look after in um, in the crustacea collections. So copepods are like little, um, they're little crustaceans. They look like a... 
the little woodlouse type thing that lives in the sea? Yeah, oh, 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 that, um, yes, definitely. Um, what else they can predate on? Um, oh, the larvae, the crab larvae as well. So the crab larvae have particular uh, special names because um, they don't look at anything like a tree crab when, when they're in the larval stage, so they've got various zoe stages. So um, that's all part of the plankton of the ocean that um, the jellyfish might eat. And also so try you... to challenge a few other bigger animals with this thing. So in answer to Anna and Zeb, if you want to find out about jellyfish poo, maybe you're going to have to study marine biology and do a PhD. Yeah. There's always room for another <laughs> PhD, isn't there? <laughs> always room for one more. Um, you mentioned the, the, the kind of larval stage of crabs. On the subject of, of larvae, um, so Kalpesh has asked, one of our viewers has been asking, uh, do jellyfish lay egg? Like how, how, how do they reproduce? Yeah, so um, what you can all see there, they do actually um, um, release eggs and sperm into the ocean where they get fertilised. Um, then um, that fertilised egg then become um, kind of um, changes um, into a larval form. And then the larvae then find, because, so all of that is free swimming in the ocean, but then um, to reproduce to the, um, or to form to the next stage, um, in terms of the larvae turning into um, to mature and to turn into polyps, they need to find a hard surface, a hard a substrate. And then there are various um, shapes and forms, as you can see there, that have actually different names of um, the types of polyps that mature until they look like similar to um, a, a young um, jellyfish maturing um, into a medusae phase. But um, the, the polyp stage actually, um, corals um, actually um, have polyps. And um, I um, liken them to like a mini sea anemone. So um, it's just a like smaller it. version. And then you can see how that all kind of interconnects and, and relates. Um, so the polyps on a coral reef, for instance, are the feeding organism organism of the reef, the mouth of the reef. So a reef can have, you know, hundreds of thousands of polyps, so many mouths. Mm. So up till that point, it's quite similar to, you know, the, their relatives, the corals and the anemones, but then at a certain stage, they'll kind of, they'll go independent and they'll- They, they'll go independent they'll again. And, uh, and the ocean. Ocean. Yes, exactly. So, uh, where, you know, where can we find jellyfish? I mean, obviously, the sea. I didn't get this far from knowing that, but are they are they evenly distributed all over the world. Are they, do they prefer certain types of water? Um, well, different species of jellyfish um, live in different parts of the world, um, but um, you know, in terms of ocean currents, and we talk a lot about climate change now and the effects of that. That can sometimes distribute. Um, you know, um, accidentally or otherwise, um, jellyfish to different different parts, different coastlines. Um, you might often, um, well, increasingly, I say often, but increasingly, um, you know, here in the UK, we are seeing more and more um, jellyfish being beached. Um, so finding them on the sand, on the coastline, and you know, in in huge numbers, and and wondering why why is it, and and so, you know, sometimes. Um, you might see the siphonophores um, that we, we've shown um, being beached, um, and that's not a great sight either because um, in terms of that happening, it, then it's telling you something about what's going on in the ocean um, and, and how often that's occurring. It's co occurring more than usual, different times of year. What, what's happening there? Is it that certain currents are drawing different species into different parts of the world? or they're sourcing um, food that they can't get in their, their, um, in their own um, their previous um, ocean habitats um, and, and are trying to go further afield to, to source the food? Um, is it because us as human beings are kind of, um, you know, overfishing, so therefore they don't have um, the, the young fish or the other animals that they would usually predate on? And so essentially when jellyfish and beach, they're, they're, they're you know, not got um, much of a chance at all of survival because they need water 
um, to survive. Their, their body is now more than 80%, 90% um, um, fluid. So um, uh, being on land, you know, the bell of that siphonophore is going to dry out, the gas is going to deplete that would have usually kept it afloat. Um, so, yes, it's... Mm. Yeah, I think, this is a really, I think this is a really good example of how... Uh, by studying how how, how these uh, organisms are turning up on our beaches and in what number, what sorts, what times, where, then we can use that to infer a lot of really important uh, other information about the state of the ocean ecosystem. So they're kind of being used as a what we, what we call a bioindicator. Oh, definitely, uh, uh, very much so. And um, actually, if I go back to the collections that we've got at the museum, so. Um, the, the beauty of the museum's historical collections, that's a huge informative time series as well. And so we can often use those jellyfish collections to inform the, um, the current research, the, the live research that is going on um, at the moment as well. So, you know, definitely indicator species and collections are great for um, informing um, current and conservation practices and what's going on in the world's ocean. And we've had uh, a few questions from our viewers about how long they can live, because I, I think some of them have uh, heard of the so-called immortal jellyfish. Yeah, oh, look how beautiful that is. That looks like a UFO, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> you know, and oh, oh, it looks like... Out and saying hello. Yeah, yeah, here I am. And jelly, jellyfish in general might live, um, you know, about a year or so, but... But this um, um, immortal jellyfish, it's a Turritopsis species, um, actually can, uh, can regenerate essentially forever. And I would say that um, image there makes it look quite big, but it, it's tiny. It's the size of a pea, you know, about one centimetre. And um, so, you know, the, the, the tiny things in the ocean are really invaluable to actually study. So this animal, um, actually, when um, it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the bell of its jellyfish and its tentacles start to um, degrade or die off, and essentially seem to disappear, um, some of the cells within um, the body of that jellyfish, they seem to regenerate within a few days. And so then a life cycle starts again. So it's kind of like being forever young. Um, and um, I'm sure some of us some of us that are fans of jellyfish might want to come back in another life to or or you know <laughs> have that superpower to be able to regenerate and live forever and are, are there people are there people uh, researching the immortal jellyfish at the moment to um, see what the secret is there is um there's a, there's a few people not that many i know there's one researcher in particular based in japan and and with a lot of animals in the ocean, including um, immortal um, jellyfish, um, you know, these studies take time. I mean, we know a lot about it, but there's probably a lot more um, we can take from that. The genetics of this jellyfish as well to be researched. And um, yeah, so it's, it's a lot of long term research. Yeah. In the deep ocean, it really is. Yeah. So we've got to have time. And. At the moment, I don't live forever, but that kind of information, you kind of, we're documenting it and we're passing on to future generations of studies. So, yeah. And um, if people want to find out more about the immortal jellyfish, I think there's a, a, a surprising science video on our National Museum mm -hmm. channel, which uh, you presented yourself. Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah. So yeah. after this it's Nature Live show, if you want to find out more about the immortal jellyfish, check out our YouTube channel. Um, you know, look at this picture. If if anyone says that jellyfish aren't cute, you can show them that picture and it's it's obviously such a beautiful it's, thing. It's absolutely amazing. Stunning. You know, some people might some people might disagree, but oh. <laughs> hopefully we've changed their minds today. <laughs> um so how how we, we mentioned earlier about uh, jellies getting beached um and being able to study ocean currents from that. Mm. Do they only drift around on the currents or do, do they have a way of propelling themselves? Well, yeah, they do have a, a way of propelling themselves. And you can see that beautiful jellyfish there. Look at that. They're really looking quite glamorous for a jellyfish, dare I say it. Um, <laughs> and um, you can see the long, stringy tentacles going down. But in the middle, that kind of central, frilly bit, 
fronds or arms, you can call them. There's usually four of those and it uses it to propel itself. So you can see the image changing there. So that's how they pr propel themselves through the ocean. Um, you know, either quite fr frantically or just very gracefully. Um, yeah, you can see that, that kind of motion going on there. So yeah. Amazing. That's one of the things that I think is so peaceful about them. But then, yeah. also, you know, it must be <clears throat> for an organism living in such a, a big environment as the ocean with these, these massive strong currents that, that will move them around. It, you know, then they must have to kind of adapt to, to, to quite a varied kind of life if, if they're going to be constantly moved around by these currents and they don't have a very strong swimming ability to, to be able to overcome them. Yeah, well, um, they'll they'll move by by the tides. I mean, um, we were talking about them being beached, um, and there's also um, what happens in the oceans too. Um, <laughs> our jellyfish um, blooms as well, and again, that is um, a cause of either warming waters. Um, um, so there's over reproduction of these animals, but also that due to uh, us as human beings um, overfishing in the oceans, the jellyfish themselves, their natural pet predators to control um, the um, population of jellyfish are, are actually absent in the whole kind of ecosystem in the food chain. So you get this massive explosion of a lot of jellyfish, um, you know, congregating together. Um, which is not good in, in 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 some instances at all. But um, there there have been some interesting ideas what to do about um jellyfish blooms. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, one of one of our viewers, Oliver, has asked, what are the the natural predators of a jellyfish? Um, sometimes they can be other other large fish, but essentially, if you think about it, um, that something gelatinous and full of you know essentially water how much nutrients can it give to an animal um and um so it's it's a sense of that um in terms of their population control um it'd be quite quite limited um and they're more likely um and they have adapted in a way of survival um i mean they're fragile in their in in their nature in terms of they can um you know get damaged quite easily but they have they they have the ability like the immortal jellyfish to uh, either clone themselves regenerate um but also their sting so uh, you know a number of jellyfish have adapted different levels of in terms of survival um and and so we have things like um the box jellyfish um that, so I guess uh, if you're not very nutritious and you're covered, yeah, well, no, then you're, you're not going to be a, a, a very popular <laughs> target. Although like it, turtles, some sea turtles, uh, some, some, yeah, uh, but, right? Um, yes, they do, and I'll be interested in because I haven't um, looked at any studies of the total nutritional value. How much a, a turtle or another animal might? How many um, jellyfish they might have to eat to get? You know all the essential nutrients that they have, but I can imagine it be, need to be quite a few. But but maybe I could be proof wrong. I have to look into that research. I think maybe it'd be like a jellyfish side salad with a, a yeah. Well, they um, are eaten in some. They're not they're known to be jellyfish. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that later. <laughs> um, so an, another thing that that some jellyfish are known for is producing light with their bodies, um, sometimes in. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. Bioluminescence. And, and can you expand on this a bit? So can all jellyfish do it? Can only some of them do it? How do they produce the light? Yeah, well, um, some of them can do it. I mean, um, this, or some more than others. I think this image here, because um, I visit a lot of aquariums around the world, and those, those are moon jellyfish. And, and if you have them in an aquarium, then you can have um, fancy light, um, filters within your tank that um, then get those moon jellyfish to um, show up or absorb that light in that way so that looks quite 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 beautiful but there are um, I think behind you actually Khalil you've got a picture of an atoller I think um, there so oh, on the other side and no. um, they're, they're well <laughs> on the other side that you just pointed to there but um, on, on the big red one right. yeah the big red one um, that coronate um, a form of jellyfish, I think. 
Um, and um, but anyway, the atollar species of, um, of of jellyfish they can emit, so they 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 um, uh, produce light, the bioluminescence. Um, one as a warning signal to other predators, keep away. And sometimes um, light can be emitted to uh, for the curiosity of other animals to come near and then we will trap you with our sting and um, digest you and you will die, that kind of thing. Um, and so the deeper you go in the ocean, obviously there's less light as well. But, um, you know, you get the dynamics of the greens and the red lights sort of um, you can see throughout the ocean. There is another form of jelly um, called um, uh, uh, tinafore. And that and, and, and the common name for that is like a sea gooseberry as well. And that does emit light as well in the ocean. So it's like um, kind of like a, a rugby ball shape, some of them. And then they've got strips down the side that you can see as they move along that you see the bioluminescence of like kind of reds and greens kind of going up and down like um, oh God, fancy um, fairy lights, essentially. Yeah, I think so, you know you might have seen them in documentaries about the deep sea or something. Oh yeah, a lot of them. Beautiful yeah. patterns. Uh, so you know, one day I'll get down there and I'll see. <laughs> um, so uh, there's there's something that jellyfish are probably the most famous for, and we haven't really properly addressed so far in our conversation, and that is the sting. Um, so we've had quite a lot of questions as well from our audience about this about. Do all jellyfish sting for a start? Um, varying levels. Um, some uh, a, a, a mild sting. Some um, the the some of the um, like the moon jellyfish. The, the sting would not harm the humans. Um, and um, and and even some fish. And I'll just so quickly I'll just jump out of jellyfish a little bit. But you know, you might see clownfish living amongst um, particular corals or anemones and things. Well, they have a mucus coating or over their scales that protects them from the sting, so they can, as a as a fish, can live amongst um, sort of stinging animals. But um, one of the most deadly um, jellyfish. Um, is, is the box jellyfish to human beings. And so that is a really, well, it's a lethal sting. You can see it there, box jellyfish, because you can see it has four um, stinging tentacles, um, like a box, four corners of it. Um, and um, yes, a very lethal, lethal sting. The animal itself, because we've got a couple in the collection, it's not that big um, in diameter. Um, what would I say? Sort of. Gosh, probably about 10 centimetres, 10, 12. Okay, it's about, about that big as well. Yeah, about, about, about that big. Yeah, all the ones that we have anyway. And, um, yeah, there's always, um, if anybody does get sting, you know, there is that that common thing um, that we all say, oh, let's pee on it. Um, and that's, I, I wouldn't recommend it because, um, um because of the chemistry of the urine, it probably might aggravate the sting a lot more and make no, it more intense. Sting injuries. Uh, we have an image of a jellyfish sting injury. Mm. Uh, in, in, you know, if you're of particularly delicate disposition in the audience, yeah. you might not want to look at it. Some people don't like looking mm. at it, but we're going to show it now. Um, yeah. This is a typical um, mark from a from a jellyfish injury. Yeah, um, I mean, then we shouldn't wee on them. No, I, I would suggest not. I would say, well, get to hospital as soon as you can or seek some medical, um, full medical advice as soon as you can. Um, maybe uh, douse it in a, you know, or splash on it a bit of um, uh, seawater, but definitely get medical attention. Um, yeah, you just have to be careful about the kind of um, adding more chemicals to a sting that might deepen, um, uh, you know, the, the severity of it all. Yeah. So how does the sting work? Because you just touch the, the tentacle and you get stung, but how, how does how does this? Well, well, see, it's a, as you can see there. It's a, it's a it's a defense mechanism, and so um, along um, the the tentacles of a jellyfish, you'll have um, their various varying um, numbers of stinging cells. So you can see there, which actually, when you brush against the tentacle, it's a defense, and um, so you you get stung. 
So it's kind of like, well, you can see it's, it's, it's a trigger. So it's a coiled um, spring within a cell that when you brush past it, it gets triggered and it, it shoots that harpoon, that sting into you. And then it's the chemical that it induces on, on the surface or into our bodies that then create those red reactions, those lumps and bumps and things. And for someone like me, because I'm quite allergic to everything, <laughs> it's not going to be a great outcome. <laughs> at all because i'm very sensitive and we've had some <laughs> questions from our viewers about the stings um so daniel has been asking can jellyfish sting each other oh he's always asked some really good questions that's something that i've never thought about or even read can they sting each other oh you know what i really do know that that's a really good oh, question and i was there. there you know it's yeah. And Whether it would be um, the same species or two individuals of different species. Well, I'm sure that they might, because it, you know, be, being competitive species, they might have some kind of thing where they're battling it out, but maybe the sting is not as, I'm kind of guessing here, but that's so, that's such a cool question. I love that. Very good. <laughs> it's good my question. mind kind of thinking. <laughs> um, um, yeah, my library of as to uh, can they can the jellyfish still sting when they are dead? Right, I get up uh, before the time on the on, on, the, on the land. Um, I I get up before the time, and I and there may be somebody out there that when something is being beached, a uh, jellyfish. See, the thing is, when jellyfish are beached, or the um, uh, the jellyfish that are kept to preserved in our jars. You know, we all wear safety equipment. We wear, you know, um, you know, um, natural gloves, thick gloves. We're we're taking them out of the jar very carefully with, um, you know, um, instruments, um, scientific instruments like um, forceps and things like that. Um, how we manipulate it. Um, so don't actually physically touch them after they're dead. So. I don't know if anybody has sacrificed themselves to try this one out. <laughs> but I do get asked this a lot by by other scientists that I work with. And I said, well, I don't know. I have to, you well, know. <laughs> so, so guessing from, from that process and that, that diagram that you just explained, it, if it, it seems like it's, a, it's an active process of the stinging cells. They have to be triggered and then they fire out. Yeah, so if they're guess, dead, then that's going to... Yeah, although, although I guess, you know, when do you decide that a jellyfish is dead? Because if it washes up on, on the beach, you know, it, it, some of it might, some cells of it might kind of die relatively quickly, but there might be. Yeah, I was just about to say, so for, something, yeah, so for something like that, if you think about it, yes, some cells might die quicker than others. And there may be, given on the time period where you're going to collect this thing off the beach, there may be some that could be triggered but I haven't read any studies about it, but there, there, there's possibly out there because there are people um, that go down to the beach and that officially sort of clear up these things or just leave them naturally for them to be washed back out, that the dead jellyfish to be washed back out. But I know um, many of my colleagues have also queried the jellyfish in, in jars. And you, know, you said earlier about, we, you know, they have a chemical sting and then we preserve them in formaldehyde, another chemi chemical themselves, you know, but we don't handle them, handle them. So don't know <laughs> in that way, you know, without the gloves. But I would say, uh, I think, you know, we've talked quite enough about how nasty the stings can be. Mm -hmm. um, let's look at jellyfish in in the in the in the wider ecosystem because they can do these things called blooms which is where you have a big flourishing mm. um, of, of jellyfish and you get loads of them in one place. You know, like how, do you know how, how big these can get? Oh it can be massive um, because um, I'm not sure if you've got a picture there but um, it, you know in there you can you can see there and those are some really big ones and that's such an amazing sight, but also quite um, a sad sight as well, in 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 a sense, um, because uh, congregating in such masses there is it, it's, it's not good as well. But I know they um, have been when when they bloom, certain jellyfish have been harvested 
and um, uh, you know other ways of actually um, using jellyfish because we mentioned jellyfish soup earlier on and things like that. But um, yeah, it's um, as I was discussing earlier, it kind of um, shows well, you know, an indicator of well, why is this happening? What's going on in the ocean there that has caused them to come in land in in such a way to do with the tides, to do with the warming of the ocean lack of food, other things that they've all congregated in in such masses like that. And I guess also big congregations of jellyfish can sometimes cause problems with stuff like fishing nets. And I remember hearing one story about how the, uh, there was a nuclear power plant on the coast and it was using seawater to cool the reactor, but then okay. it's blocked. blocked by loads of jellyfish. Yeah, so um, and, and that is what you don't want to happen. Um, because obviously that that's a, a, a cost to that that kind of industry and everything, and of concern that um, the reactor will will get blocked, and you'll have to invest time and money in kind of clearing that, and I and also prevention mechanisms in the future for that happening again as well. So um, yeah, that is a massive indicator that that something is wrong and why is that happening? And, and that is a cost to the fishing industry, um, to other um, industrial um, industries as well, yeah. And, uh, you know, we've, we've mentioned a couple of times very briefly that you can, humans can in some ways eat jellyfish. <laughs> let's, yeah. let's talk about that a little bit because personally I've had a, <clears throat> a, a spicy fried jellyfish salad and that was absolutely um, obviously, it's a <laughs> bell. You don't eat the tentacles. That would be <laughs> on the dice a little bit. <laughs> See, yeah, you wouldn't eat the tentacles. Um, yeah, I haven't personally, but it's 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 interesting. I suppose it just tastes of the sea. With, it's with kind of like the texture, almost like um, it's almost like cucumber, but a okay. little bit, kind of like yeah. you know, a lot, cucumber is mostly water as well. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Yeah, and um, we've got they they have been known to um, dry dry the jellyfish and um, grind it up and and put it into um, sweets as well. Um, so that happens too. And I must say, I've not tasted the soups and stir fries or the sweets either. And I don't, know, I don't think it. Not knowingly, I would, um, but I trust your judgment that it tastes like you kind of like. <laughs> So I do like certain types of seafood. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably eat it again. I'll be interested in trying those candies because um, when you told me about this story about the about the toffees, from, that I read up about the story, and apparently um, the idea was developed by a uh, a group of uh, like a class of Japanese uh, high school yeah. science students yeah. um, because there was a massive bloom of jellyfish and they were coming yeah. up with ideas of what they could do with it, mm. and they decided to make them into candies, um, and actually it took off and they were really popular. Yeah, I mean, in in some ways, that's that's a way of of though that kind of thing not going to waste. So being resourceful and just trying things out, you've got the opportunity to try it out and see whether it catches on. Um, yeah. So. Hmm. <laughs> so um, I think we've got time for to cover a little bit more ground before we go for some last questions from our audience, um, and then we wrap up. So you guys at home, if you've got any last little bits that you really want to know from Miranda, do drop them comments now and then in a couple of minutes we'll come to them. Um, but first of all, um, your collection, or our collection at the museum, but the collection that you look after, it doesn't just include biological specimens, does it? It also includes some really beautiful works of art um, that mm -hmm. are scientific objects. Why don't you explain that a little bit for the audience? Yeah, so I'm lucky enough to look after another kind of collection, um, which are um, called the Blaschke Glass um, Marine Invertebrate Collection. And so part of that are the stunning jellyfish. And they were made by a father and son team that were based um, in Dresden in the um, 1860s. And they started making sea creatures out of glass. And so um, they're so actually- these are all handmade 150 these are, years ago. These are all handmade. These are all handmade. And they were available for order at that period of time in the 1800s um, worldwide. And so we are lucky enough to have um, several different forms of, of jellyfish. And um, you can see, it, it's amazing. As a father and son team, they worked exclusively together you know, this um, jellyfish collection, so we've got a collection of um, 
uh, sea anemones that were made in the 1860s, but this collection of jellyfish were made um, in the 1870s, I think 1876, um, ordered by the museum. And um, it, the craftsmanship, I, I mean, and as glass artists, um, the blasters were amazing. And actually, when you look at them, because uh, when we were talking about the jellyfish, um, looking at them from above, you can actually see the um, horseshoe shapes of the, the gonads, the sexual parts. So all of these models are, you know, there's such attention to detail in them. And they're only, um, so those glass models are only about, um, I think it's 19 centimetres high, including the base. Um, and they're amazing and really special that they have kept for so long, considering they're made out of glass and, and very fragile. But, you know, the reasons, one of the reasons why they, they were made is because um, you know, most of the jellyfish I look in, the, look after in the collection, they're often slumped in the bottom of the jar. There's very few that actually are hanging from hooks in the lid of the jar that you can see the full extent of the jellyfish. So here you can actually see the true shape and form. You know, in created in glass, they can keep their shape and form and the elements of colour as well. So that was the beauty. And often these were exhibited alongside the actual real specimen to give people a, an idea of what the actual sea creatures look like in the ocean. So they're just think, amazing. No, I think it's amazing that there's such beautiful uh, handmade art objects, but at the same time, they are scientifically accurate enough that yes. an expert like yourself, you know, can actually, you know, Look at them and 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 recognize the the kind of the authenticity. Yeah. yeah, so they you know just like teaching models essentially, and so they are in the kind of the science and art category because a lot of museums have have um, similar models to these because they were ordered for you know for many teaching colleges and universities and museums are, are around the world, and many of them still exist. So yeah, that's another thing as well as going around um, looking at jellyfish in aquariums. I do travel the world at looking at other museums and their Blaschka collections as well. So I have the joy of going behind the scenes and seeing some of their collections or seeing them on display as well. Awesome. Well, when when the museum opens back up, I'll come and uh, come and visit your collection. And you can... More than welcome. <laughs> We've got time for one last question from the audience. Oh, wow. that people have asked about, um, and that's. You know, in light of, uh, you know, the chemicals in their stings and the immortal jellyfish's weird life cycle, uh, are people using jellyfish in research for any kind of medical purposes? Um, yes, they are. I'm continuing to do so, especially around, um, well, um, around um, any... Um, chemical treatment for, for stings, bath treatment for stings, because as we mentioned earlier, um, the box jellyfish is a very lethal and de deadly sting, so you need um, a fast working antidote for that. Um, in terms of um, the chemistry of their um, bioluminescence there as well, they're looking into the, the, the genes there. Um, and the immortal jellyfish, we need more people, um, unless I haven't found them yet, but to study the immortal um, jellyfish as well and the genetics are around that too of, of what you know why and, and how and also why other jellyfish can't do that in that way too so yes there's a lot of research going on um, as I say our, our collection is available for research too to inform and um, what's going on um, currently for living jellyfish too so um, yeah, and we're continually talk, talking about our collections and, and science and, and, and medicine and everything. We're continually finding within our own jellyfish collection, the researchers coming in um, are finding new species as well to science. Um, because with technology now, you can see, as you can imagine, it's well, it's gelatinous. Some of them are see-through. How do you look at something like that down the microscope and, and get all the details? So I admire, you know, um, um, a number of scientists that actually do this, um, but some of our, our jellyfish are actually stained, so you can see particular organs. But as technology improves, you can have um, different kinds of like CT scanning and, and all the rest of it to understand an, um, uh, an animal like that, then um, it would inform um, a lot more what we're doing and how jellyfish live. But a lot of these things, as I say, in the deep ocean are long-term studies.
Yeah. But so we make little we're, steps. So we're always finding new jellyfish and we're always finding out new stuff about the jellyfish that we do know about. Yeah. I think a really good place to leave it because we, we haven't even overrun our time because we're well, so much to talk about. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Miranda. Oh, it's I'm a pleasure. Thank you, Leo. Mm, thank, thank you so much. I'll see you soon. Right, bye. And thank you at home so much for joining us today as well. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Please do join us again for more nature live shows at 12 on Tuesdays and 10.30 on Fridays. Keep an eye on our social media channels as well. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, as well as nhm.ac.uk. Until next time. That was Miranda Lowe, I'm Khalil Thurloway, and this has been Nature Live. Goodbye. <laughs>